next few weeks coming from the pulpit, um, myself and the elders and, and Lowell have, have kind of come up with this. Over the next four weeks, we're going to move into this topic in, in a remembrance of Easter, and we've titled the series, I think it's on your bulletin, The Wondrous Cross. Uh, and this morning, as we look at the Wondrous Cross, we'll specifically be looking at the role of the law in regards to the Wondrous Cross. And, and whenever I hear the word law, I, I, I like to think of the, the funny laws in America that we actually have. Like, there's some really bizarre laws if you look on the books. And so I've actually grabbed a couple of them, and I, I kind of wanted to start out with a few of these that I thought were, were pristine. So, so one of them, a law in Connecticut, actually, is that if you want to start a pickle company, then you have to legally verify that your pickle will bounce if you drop it from one foot high. So you take your pickle, have to hold the foot off the ground and drop it, and it has to bounce for you to be able to sell those pickles. Because I guess there was like some shyster who was trying to sell pickles that were not pickles or something, and they didn't bounce. So they made this rule that if your pickles are legitimate, they'll bounce, and you have to prove that your pickles are legitimate before you can sell them in Connecticut. Uh, another one comes out of, of Georgia, actually. If you ever are on vacation to Gainesville, Georgia, you are required by law to eat fried chicken with your bare hands. You are not allowed to use utensils. It is against the law to use utensils to eat fried chicken in Gainesville, Georgia. You have to use hands. And I guess someone actually got arrested over it. I, it's a big deal there, I suppose. I guess that's the founding of fried chicken was Gainesville, Georgia. And they take it very seriously that you eat it the correct way, which is your bare hands. I don't know why anyone would eat it any other way, but that's besides the point. Now, I bring up these, these couple of laws to, to kind of give us ideas of some of the laws that we as humans have to live by, and seemingly how odd it is that most of the laws that we actually are supposed to live by, we don't really have a clue what they actually are. We, we have laws that are very important to us, and, and we know those. But a lot of laws have no bearing on our lives, and so we don't actually fill brain space up learning them because they're irrelevant for us. A law we might know really well is, is that you have to have a driver's license in order to drive. Like, that's a law. We all drive every day. We know that law. We might know the age you're required to be before you can get your driver's license. I think most all of us would know that that is 16 at the moment in Michigan before you can get your driver's license. That's, that's something relevant. But a law we might not know is the age you have to be to become the president. And maybe some of you do know what that age is, but maybe you don't know what the age or the number of years you have to be a resident in America to become a president. So first you have to be born in America, and then you have to live here for so many years before you become a president to actually be the president. And you have to be so old before you can become the president. You might not know what those things are because the reality is, sorry, I don't think anyone in here is going to be a president in the future. Now, I don't want to demean anyone in any way. I'm just calling out the odds of, of anyone here becoming the president of the United States of America. And the only other reason you might know these is because maybe you're a lawyer and it's your job to know these laws, but that's even kind of an odd law to know for a lawyer because you generally wouldn't have to deal with that. But what does all this have to do with Christianity? What does this have to do with, with God or with the cross? How do we actually view the laws of the Bible compared with the laws of, of the state or of, of the government? And how do the laws in the Bible actually impact our lives today? Now, I want to read out of Jeremiah chapter 31 this morning, kind of use that as a, a launch pad for some of our understanding of the law in view of the cross of Christ. But before we do that, I want to start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into Jeremiah chapter 31. So let's, let's pray. God, we 
thank you for this time we can gather here. I pray that your spirit would, would work, that you would open our eyes, that we would see your laws, that we would see your, your decrees, and that we would desire to follow them, that we would desire to, to live according to the rules you've put in place around us, and that we would ultimately seek you out and seek to love you as Lord and, and ruler over our lives. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're out of uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 through 34. And that says, This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now, when we're looking at these verses, I kind of want to hone in on three kind of specific words, but specific concepts that we're actually going to be, be looking through. And the first word specifically is law, as we're talking about laws. Now, before that, I want to clarify kind of one thing about Jeremiah chapter 31. And this is the interpretation of what's actually happening here. So it's talking about this, this new covenant right away. And I want to uh, clarify that by, by my understanding, and I would say the common Protestant church understanding about this, is that this new covenant that it's talking about is a new covenant that has already happened. And what we understand is that new covenant is from Christ. It's from his, from his death on the cross. And when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we talked about the Lord putting, you know, the Holy Spirit inside of us, that he is in our minds and hearts. And so we see that called out within this piece of the law as well. And I, I jumped through that a little quickly because I don't really want to focus on that. I more want to focus on the word law, but I do want to give that disclaimer about my interpretation of these verses for where I'm pulling some of the different things that I'm pulling. And so if you disagree with that interpretation, we can discuss that afterwards. But I want to define that so we have a, a, a standard context that we can look at these verses from. So... Coming to this word then, law, that we have. A law is defined as a rule defining correct procedure or behavior. And if that rule is broken, that demands a consequence or punishment for it. So, that's great. We, we understand then what a law is, but... The irony that I find when I read the Bible and when I pick this word law is that when you actually read through the Bible, you don't always read the word law. You might read a different word. One, one commonly we hear, you've heard of maybe ten laws. No, you've heard of ten commandments. So what, wh what is this law and, and commandment? What are the, what is, why is it two different words? What's being actually called out and referenced here? And it's one of those interesting kind of naming situations that a commandment is always a law. But a law is not always a commandment. If that can make sense in your mind. I'm a math person. It doesn't make any sense to me, but they say it's true. And so I just, yep, that, that works out. So a commandment is always a law, but a law is not necessarily a commandment. So you see, when we hear the word commandment, we actually are hearing a direct command from God to man. A commandment from God to man. A direct command that he has given us. And that's why we have the Ten Commandments. God directly gave those to the person of Moses. But a law doesn't necessarily constitute that exact same thing. Like, like in life, we have laws of the state, but we also have the law of gravity. It's not a law of the state. The state didn't put that in place and be like, all right, gravity is now happening because the state has decided that gravity is happening. But 
you can't get away from the law of gravity. You can try, you know, basketball athletes would love to be able to get away from it, but they can. It always is going to pull them back down. That's a, a law that, that we have to live by. And so within God, we have these same things. There are laws about God, maybe the fact that God is love. That is a law about God. It's not a commandment that he's presented to us, but it's a law that defines him. So we, we hopefully have that, that breakdown clear. We have know what a law and what a commandment what the difference maybe of those two things are. The trouble I find, though, is that the more I read in Scripture, the more I, I come up with all these different words like decree and ordinance and precept and way and statutes, and, and the list just continues to go on and on and on. And I think all these are supposed to be law, but there's so many variations. I, I found uh, some verses out of the Psalms, the, the 119th Psalm, actually, and I won't read the whole thing, just a few of them. Starting at verse 1, it says, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their hearts. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. So it was the first eight verses of the 119th Psalm, and I actually hit almost all of those words defining law that <laughs> we were talking about. Just like boom, 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 boom. So what are all these different words actually mean? Now, some of you are probably like, okay, tell us, you know, I've really been curious about this. And sadly, I'm not going to tell you what all these different words actually mean. I didn't, I didn't take the time to, to look into that. If you're interested, you can talk to maybe someone who's went to law school. They might know what all these different words mean. But, but as a kid growing up, I always wondered, like, man, why, does it, why doesn't it just use the word law every time? Why does it make it so difficult? Because the reality is, kind of in general, the words mean laws. They're, they're rules. They're, they're things put in place around us. And so because of my simple mind, I'm just going to stick with that specific meaning. When you see these different words, like decrees or statutes or precepts, they do have a specific meaning. There is a specific reason that word was used compared to another one. Now in the Psalms, maybe it's because it rhymed. I don't know. I mean, with their poetry, that could have been the reason they picked one word versus the other. But but in Deuteronomy, there's specific reasons you said precept and not statute, because a precept was this and a statute was this. And as I said, a lawyer would understand that. But I, I don't want to, to dive into that detail too much. I just want to, to bring to light that as you're reading through Scripture and you see these different things presented, they're all calling you out to what is the law. So we're just going to gonna stick with that. So in every way that we can, we are to obey God's word. We are to obey the law. We read in, in verse 7 of that Psalm 119, it says, I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. So as Christians... We need to, to look at that very seriously. We should learn to love the law of the Lord. The one that the Holy Spirit has written on our hearts as we read in Jeremiah. Those laws should fill us with joy. And we should seek the blessings ultimately that can come from, being, from living according to them. From, from living under them. And, and so there's a lot more that could be said defining the intricacies of the law that's spelled out here, but, but hopefully that gives you an idea of, of some of the variations that you might see as you read through scripture and how they, you can view them as the law. But I want to move then from this word law to the, the second of the three words I want to talk about, and that is this word covenant. So we started with law, and now we're moving to the word 
covenant. And it says this right away in, in verse 33. It says, this is a covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. Now, this kind of doesn't make a lot of sense just as verse 33, but if we flip to verse 31, we maybe can get a little context for what's being talked about here. In verse 31, it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. So this new covenant being made implies that there was an old covenant that's being replaced. So in the Sunday school downstairs, we've actually been going through the book of Hebrews, which is extensively talking about the transition from the old covenant to the new covenant and and all the intricacies that kind of work through within that. We define the old covenant as the Mosaic covenant. Sometimes we refer to it as the covenant of sin and death or maybe the covenant of the law. See, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. That's why we say the Mosaic Covenant, because Moses was kind of the guy in charge at that time. He gave those as laws for the people of Israel to live by, and so set up a covenant with those people. And this this covenant that he set up with them says, if you will obey these commandments I will give you, then you will be my people, and I will be your God. And if you disobey these commandments that I give you, you will stop being my people and you will all die. In in paraphrase form, let's say. And so this this covenant that he gives to these people presents this, this binary situation. Either you're my people and you're listening to me or you're not and you're not. And I've always wondered why did God set this covenant up this way. You know, if I was God, I would have probably done it like this instead of like that. That's a dangerous thing to think. Don't necessarily think that, but but why would God go to all this trouble and and set up all of Israel going through all this time and doing all of these things? Why didn't he just throw Jesus down right after Adam, knock the thing out of the park, and be, be done with all this work that we have to do as humans? What What was this purpose? Why did he set all these things, put all these things in motion when he could have just figured it all out right away? Why didn't he jump right to the end? Why would he set up the law of sin and death in the first place? That that seems like a terrible law to set up or a terrible covenant to have, right? God's supposed to be a God of love, but he set up a covenant of sin and death. I don't see love necessarily in there. How does that actually apply to us? That, that sounds like a really weird way to, to show love. And so, so I'm you know, thinking about this. Why can God set up these things? Why did he put all these things in motion, especially if he claims to love? How can God actually do these things within the law, within this covenant that don't necessarily seem okay. And honestly, this has been a a thought rolling around in my mind for for kind of years as to why, as as you've heard me say a number of times before, I'm an engineer and I like to know why things work. And so when I look at this, I'm like, why does this work the way that it does? Couldn't have you done it like this and then it would have worked a little bit better? It's not that way with God. If God did it a certain way, it works the best way. But but, but I always like to, to dig into it and think about it. And so if you'll bear with me, I've, I've got some, something I, I've kind of worked together. And hopefully this can, can resonate with, with some of you. And I've kind of wrote it out as, as God talking to Adam after Adam has sinned. And maybe this will, will resonate with you in regards to, to maybe why God has set up this structure in this way. So we have sin. It enters the world through Adam, right? And God is a just God. He's perfect. He's holy. We've we've extensively talked about this. And so he must destroy the sin in the world. However, God also is a God of love, and he loves 
Adam. He wants to maintain a relationship with him and not just instantly kill him for the sin that he committed. So what does he do? Well, at that moment, he then decided, well, he would have pre-decided that. Don't state it that way. But, but at that moment, he, he took and puts this law in place and says, okay, Adam, you broke my law, which in essence means we can never be in true relationship with each other again, ever. We can't, because you have broke my law. My justice, my holiness demands that that can't happen but my love demands that we, that we do, that we continue to be in relationship with each other. And so I've crafted a way that we can be in relationship again. And it's called the covenant of sin and death. And Adam's like, what? Covenant of sin and death is how we're going to be in relationship with each other together? That, that doesn't even make any sense. What, what, have you, what are you doing here? How is that, that going to happen? He's like, no, it's fine. I'm going to present this to a man named Moses many years from now. And the covenant will say, as we just read, if you obey me, then you can be in relationship with me. And this will allow the relationship between us to return so that man can be in relationship with God again. Because I've made this covenant that if you will follow my commands, then you can be in relationship with me. That's the covenant that I'm making. And so a new precedent will have been set at that point that man can be in relationship with God. But Adam, he's like, that's fine, but, but looking at this law, looking at this covenant, no one can ever do that. My sin, what I've done is endowed on all men coming forward. They carry this burden of my sin on them. So how can they ever be in right relationship with you? How can they ever follow this law? Why would you put this law in place? It's impossible. It can't be done. It can't happen. And God looks at him really seriously, like, yeah, you're, you're right. You, it can't be. I'm, I'm perfect and you're not. You, you can never come to be in relationship with me. But... I have to build this infrastructure because my justice, it demands it. It demands that there is this infrastructure in place that says, you have to be perfect to come be in relationship with me. And this, this is where the incredible part of this whole, this whole plan actually comes in place, you see? You see, man can't do it, but I will send my son Jesus into the world as a man. Do you see that? It doesn't have to be you as a man, it can be my son Jesus said a man, and he will come into this world and he will do it. He will take this covenant that I've put in place, this law of sin and death, and he will beat it. He will be perfect. He will follow everything according to everything I've, I've done. And just as your sin has fell upon all men, Jesus' completion, his fulfillment of this covenant that we've made between God and man will be available to all men. It will allow all of them to enter into a new covenant that's still defined by my law and still under the standing of my justice, but because of Christ can actually make them holy in a way that was impossible to fulfill my justice before. And as I said, you can take that as the ravings of a madman or think about how that actually plays out then in our lives today. So, so we have God's justice and holiness and love all working together in perfect harmony. And it caused this, this beautiful and perfectly crafted plan to all come together in the fullness of time to fulfill God's perfect plan to bring us back to a relationship with him. And you see, without the law... God's justice could not have been satisfied. And this brings us to the last word in the passage that I, I want to emphasize and actually comes at the end of, of chapter 34. And the word is forgive. It says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now if we read this forgiveness out of context of what we just talked about within this covenant, we can all say, okay, God, 
is just a hoax. He's not a just God. He can't just forgive people. If they've sinned, they're wrong. They need to go to hell. That's, that's justice. That's God. If we read it outside of the context of this covenant, a judge who lets a criminal walk away without persecution or without paying the fine is a crooked judge. They're bad. They're evil. We want to get rid of them. Justice demands retribution. If someone wrongs someone else, then the wronged man will go to the ends of the world to make sure that the one who wronged him pays for what he did. Experiences the fullest extent of the law because that's justice. And if you don't think that's true in the world today, just put two kids in a room for a few minutes. Doesn't take long for one of them to wrong the other and the one who was wronged will demand justice. Now, if the one's bigger, the justice can be very severe. But, but it, will, it will sort itself out very, very quickly. It doesn't take long. And then, if you happen to be a father of that situation, it is then your responsibility to bring retribution to the poor, wrong child. Because that's the covenant you've made with your children. But because of the covenant God made... The law he presented through Moses, he can be justified in forgiving us our sins because of Jesus. Because of what Jesus did. Because of Jesus' fulfillment of the law and of the covenant. Because of him, he's endowed on us the right to have our sins forgiven, even though we were the criminal that demanded prison that demanded death but Jesus has made a way for us to experience that forgiveness because of the covenant because of the law that God has put in place and to close I want to read out of Romans chapter 8 and it was it was kind of funny I, I I wrote this whole thing and was was looking for a good way to close and Romans 8 came up and I was like man that just like completely reiterates in four verses what I just took a half hour to kind of go through and break down because because Paul with the Holy Spirit can present something in a concise way that I in no way possibly could but in in Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 4 we read therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, because we had to do it and we can't, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteousness or the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, Jesus, through the law of sin and death, has set us free from the law of sin and death, so that we can live by his Spirit. And ultimately, we can be in right relationship with God, and we can spend eternity with him forever. Worship team, like to play. I'm glad you ended with that note there, Jubal. When I heard the word law, I automatically thought of faith. And that's what it's all about. And we're going to sing by faith. The chorus says we will stand as children of the promise. We have a new promise now, not under the law of sin and death. Thank the Lord. Would you stand, please, and, s and join us as we sing by faith.
By faith we see the hand of God In the light of creation's grand design In the lives of those who prove His faithfulness Who walk by faith and 